Hello everyone and welcome to the Death by Adaptation podcast, a bi-weekly book club where we choose one classic book and compare and contrast it against its cinematic adaptations. I am your host, Nicolo Grasso, and I'm joined, as always, by the great Yuan Gledo. How are you doing, Yuan? I'm, I'm doing alright. I have water instead of my usual cocktail of coffee and fizzy drinks. And I've also, God forbid, made actual notes this time. Oh, and I know I always man. come on and joke, oh, yeah. saying, ha ha, I've made six or seven notes. I've actually done a proper double page spread oh, this time. Oh, man. Nice. Mainly because it's this is my journal. I, I keep a journal every day to write down the, the thoughts that go along in my memory box, just so I, I can take track of things. And uh, I've got a few things to say about this this podcast. Not the podcast. I mean, like the book we're doing. Not the podcast. I'm not going to start slating us all. How dare we do this? But no, no, I'm looking forward to this one. It's good. Nice. Seems like we're back to basics. We're back to doing something a bit more serious this time around. Um, and we're still in in our very short, like interesting documentary nonfiction month. And of course, we couldn't do this without another lovely guest. A good friend of the podcast, the host of Clappercast himself, Carson Timar. How are you doing, Carson? It's so good to have you back. I'm doing great. Per usual, I put in the bare minimum effort, so I have no notes hey. at all. Um, but I'm very excited to be here. Lovely coming on this podcast. That's why I keep coming back onto it. A little oh. less fun. We're not talking about Fifty Shades of Grey or Call Me By Your Name or Clockwork Orange, but that's okay. You know, it's still going to be fun. Yes, yes. Because as you've all noticed reading the title of this episode today we're talking about one of the great film critics of all time we're talking about one roger ebert and of course before we no it's i'm sorry you are not yet not yet your time will come. not me your all time right, will right. come i'm not verified for no reason you know <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be your your excuse like you're having an argument with someone i'm verified on twitter <laughs> just damn it's, it it's already happened today <laughs> i just didn't say it oh well yeah yeah, came very close. Um, but of course, if you're listening to this, before we continue, consider leaving a five-star review. Consider dropping a like if you're watching the YouTube version. It helps us out a lot. And thank you for listening, as always. But without further ado, let's talk about life itself. I was, I think I was maybe eight or nine or something. And my aunt, Denise, who was a massive film geek, who passed her film geekdom on to me, found out about these rehearsals for the Oscars. And one day he walked through. And I remember saying, thumbs up, thumbs up, screaming, screaming. And he came over. I grew up. I made this film when I was 34 years old. It was the first film I ever made. The film <laughs> was about my aunt. My aunt who took me to the Oscars that day. Nothing wrong with that. And about losing someone that you love. And it was Ebert's review that really got to the heart of what I was trying to articulate and just uh, touched me so much that I sent him the picture from the Oscars. His reply was, we were both younger then. The next day, a blog post turned up where he wrote in a very heartfelt way about his own aunt, who kind of gave him the gift of art and film as well. You know, I broke down crying, and it was a mess. It's dangerous as a black woman to, to give something that you've made from your point of view, very steeped in your identity and your personhood, to a white man whose gaze is usually the exact opposite, and to say, you are the carrier of this film to the public. You're the one that's going to dictate whether it has value. And you had a lot less fears around that with Roger because you knew someone who was going to take it seriously, going to come with some historical context, some cultural nuance. I mean, everybody knows Roger had a black wife. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? It's like an honorary brother. I mean, you live with a sister, and it's a whole different understanding of black women, right? So maybe you watch my film differently. Life Itself is a memoir by Roger Ebert. He published it in 2011, two years before he passed away. And it is as much a book about his love of cinema and that art form and film criticism as it is a book about just life itself. But before we talk about the actual book, I have a question for you two. How did you feel about Roger Ebert going into this before watching the documentary, before reading the book? I'm very interested to know how you feel about it. Why don't you go first, Carson? 
I've always admired Ebert. Um, I, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of criticisms that we can talk about them today, but like, I've mm-hmm. always really admired his willingness and desire to um, explore cinema and promote cinema that maybe isn't just like mainstream cinema. It's very similar, weirdly, to how I feel to like Chris Duckman. I, I don't know what that mm-hmm. comment's going to do in this room, but like, <laughs> I appreciate it when a film critic has a voice. And is using that voice to not just do the bare minimum when they're using that voice to push smaller voices, when they're using that voice to look at older film, especially his great movies list is fundamental. Um, And I mean, his writing, I think, is always whether you agree with him or disagree with him. I do feel like he's being honest in his reviews. I think his show is very entertaining. Um, I've always admired Ebert. I love Ebert. Nice. You on? Um, yeah, oh, it's, no. it's, nah, see, that's the thing. It's going to sound like cliche and redundant because everyone said it, but it, it Roger Ebert and, and reading his work before I became a journalist, it, it is very much the reason I, I wanted to pursue film criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's no escape in that. And it, um, I, as I got older, I realized I didn't want to be like Ebert. I wanted to do what he did. And I think the big distinction for me uh, came quite recently. Um, the the first time I watched this documentary, probably one of my favorite documentaries of all time. But at that point, I'd seen like five hundred movies, mm. and and then you 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 go back to it and you watch thousands of films and you, you write about loads of them and you you do podcasts and you talk about films and you yell at people about why they're wrong about films and you you come full circle. But what lasts is the appreciation for Ebert and the the absolute commitment that man had to how much he managed to do. And I always compete with myself in my head where, and I suppose this we'll get into this later, but me being burnt out all the time is probably because I'm that actively, consistently trying to write more than Roger Ebert did, <laughs> which is some sort of manic drive that I have for no reason. But he, he is, he's very inspiring. He's one of the few film critics that I'm kind of like, what a sincere legacy it's a legacy that will last far beyond most of the films he reviewed it, mm-hmm. it, it is quite sudden i think life itself both the documentary and the book really do encapsulate that quite nicely yeah rog i i think it's almost by definition roger ebert is the first critic that everyone learns about and knows um and i think i said it's maybe once or twice in the past some some episodes but I never really got fully into film criticism before, like the whole YouTube scene. That's what was when you had like your Chris Tuckmans, your uh, Jeremy Johns, Schmoz, Schmoz, no, um, that era of, of like 10 years ago or whatever it was back in 2013. Um, but I did go, I, I distinctly remember at some of these people making a video about Roger Ebert when he passed away. And I was like, who, who is this man? Let's, let's, let's look into it. Um, and then ended up deep diving a little bit into his reviews, into his show with Gene Siskel. Um, and I really liked it. And he encapsulated what I loved back then, at least, about this YouTube film critics is that it was very personal. He had a very personal way of writing. And, and you said it as well, Carson. So it's just, it was his opinion. And that's all that mattered in a way. He made film, talking about films just fun and interesting and he wasn't talking down on people sometimes <laughs> and it wasn't like he was always on a podium thinking that he was better than everyone else in the room he was always looking for a conversation and a discussion about this about cinema itself and that's something that i really appreciated and i even remember doing um taking part in a workshop on film criticism back in 2017 and I went to the film critic that was holding it and hosting it. And I talked to him a little bit and I was like, oh, yeah, I, I really like, you know, Roger Ebert's style of writing. I like to put a bit of myself into the reviews. And he was like, it's bullshit, man. <laughs> we, don't, we don't like that. Um, and, and it kind of belongs in the whole, you know, more snobbish elitist type of film critic that uses a lot of heavy words that mean nothing in the end. It's like, yes, but what did you think? How did you feel about it? And so I completely agree. I I went into this really admiring Roger Ebert, but not necessarily knowing much about him. And I picked up the book and I went through it in the span of like a week. I basically ate it up. I 
was blown away by this, low key blown away by it, um, because it's 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 so much more than just a memoir. For those that don't know, Roger Ebert he was diagnosed with cancer. I want to say thyroid cancer. It was like related. To, it was like in the jaw. Where was it? Like located? Like yeah. I, was so, it in his throat? And the throat. They had to do surgery multiple times. He lost the ability to speak, to eat, to drink. Very very rough. Um, and so he spent the last seven years of his life borderline wheelchair bound, um, only able to speak through writing and through um, automate um, computer generated voices. And he spent a lot of his time just writing about his life and life itself. What I really liked about this, and I'm curious about you guys as well, is the structure. It's not, you know, let's start from when I was little and let's go like year by year by year in each single chapter. It's a bit scattershot. It's a bit just um, meandering at first, which kind of put me off. like, what's happening here? But around the fourth or fifth chapter, I entered into its rhythm. And what I loved is that and I found it very touching is that it feels like you're reading someone's just memory of life. He's just thinking back at like this, this fleeting images of his mother, of his father who passed away when he was like 10 or 12. Uh, all those little moments of his childhood. And then he just jumps ahead and he's like, and now I'm married and I have my wife and there's her family and it's massive. And then he goes back in time. And I, I really love that style, but I'm curious, how, how do you guys feel about the book, Life Itself, and this memoir as a whole? I agree with you to a point. I think that Ebert obviously is a good writer. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think he'd be where he is if he was not a good writer. Does he indulge himself maybe a little bit at times? Sure. Yes. <laughs> Does he meander quite a bit? Yeah. Did this book need to be 430 you know, pages long? No, probably not. Um, but no, I mean, it's enjoyable, definitely. I definitely think it took a little bit more at times work to get through for me than it did for you, just simply because of the length. Mm -hmm. And also, like, you know, I don't know, Roger. I don't know all of his friends. So he gets into a lot of stories about his friends, and it's like, you know, good for you, it's well written. I don't personally really care or even, like, know these people to care. Um, but no, I agree with pretty much most else of what you said. I think it's really well written. I like having such an honest and open look at him. Um, the structure I think is pretty solid in the book specifically, the movie not so mm. much, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think it was a good read. I don't think it was life changing. I don't think it was like, I'm going to read this ever again, but I am happy I read it and I'm happy that now I feel like I know the man whose career and legacy has kind of been defined by his criticism rather than his personality, if that makes sense. Yes. So I'm happy yes. I wrote, I, um, read it. Okay, it's definitely a wrong, long read, and there were a couple of chapters. Uh, I think I think they're the same. Yeah, where it's just kind of like, here's here's like this man I met in Cannes. It's twelve pages just on him. It's like okay, nice, nice, nice. Here's fifteen pages on this other friend who likes to quote the end of uh, The Great Gatsby. Okay, nice. <laughs> Let's get on with it a little bit. Um, but yes, Yuan, how about you? Um. Yeah, I, I quite like that sort of scattershot ability that Ebert has throughout life itself. It feels like a more natural flaw than dictating where things should fall. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as if it's like incredibly difficult to pinpoint where he's at in his life when he's saying, I'm a child now and I'm, I'm married. That Those two things aren't like a year or one from each other. It's it's nice progression that just uh, happens. Um and it's really nice to read. It is very readable and enjoyable, and I'd, I'd agree with what both of you said there, that it is too long. Um, I definitely didn't finish this book about five minutes <laughs> before we started recording the podcast. <laughs> I wasn't reading it at intermittent points throughout today while at work. Um, that just didn't happen. Um, no, it's it's a really well-read book, and a really well-written one as well. I, I, I agree with what Carson says. It's sort of anecdotes about his friends that really they're not really that relevant not because they're not interesting stories but because they don't really tell us anything it is literally just grandpa ebert recounting his old <laughs> favorites going oh i remember back in the day when when bonnie and clyde had just released and that reminds me of another story and it just sort of dwindles from there and whether or not it works is solely dependent on what you think of ebert 
And I think luckily all three of us quite like the guy mm. um, to, to, to varying extents, um, which I'm sure we'll get into later. <laughs> we will, we will. We will. We will. Um, I, I, I think one of the aspects that I kind of liked him, even loved about this book is that it's very bittersweet. And I don't know if it's just the way that it's written or just me bringing in the whole... No, he passed away two years after he finished writing this. So there's always this aura of death looming throughout the entire book and also in the past and some of his friendships. And even though I didn't care that much about some of the things that he was writing about, there is always this constant change, change in the world, change in cinema, change in his routine in the places that he visits. There's... There's this one chapter, or maybe it was like two chapters, but was it called the Eerie House in London? It was like this old hotel in in like hidden inside of the center of London with very cheap cheap rooms, but it had like excellent staff and service. There's just this very interesting story. It, was, it, felt, it almost felt like reading a gothic ghost story in a weird way. It's like, what is this? Was it even real? In just hear Ebert or read Ebert, recounting the first time he went there in like the late seven, like late 70s, something like that. And he kept going there like once or twice a year for multiple days at a time. And then all of that just ended. Like the owner sold the apartment to his, like sold the whole hotel to his son. The son changed some things around and now it's a luxury hotel for massive celebrities and, and all of its identity is gone. And that's one of the chapters that kind of shows what really works about this book, and it's the, just the passage of time. It's unrelenting, it's brutal, very few things are left untouched, and very few things end up being better than they were before, which is which is um, bittersweet, again, to say the least, but also very profound. And that's also another aspect that I want to talk with you about, is the narration. It's all written, of course, in first person. He's recounting his own life. And he gets into some very personal aspects of uh, his alcoholism and some of his inner demons and doubts that were very touching and surprisingly honest. How did you guys feel about that? All of his like inner workings and his growth and evolution through life. I mean, I think it was very well handled. You know, I think it helps that he's done a lot of writing on it in the past, it seems like, at least going off mm. the documentary, specifically his alcoholism. Like, these are topics that I think he seems very comfortable with bringing in. And I think it's important to bring in. I think it's important to kind of, you know, we have so many people, like, that we value, that we look up to, that we kind of immortalize and, like, I see a lot of people writing this book and not including those elements. I think mm. adding them only helps. And I w think, you know as kind of nasty as I guess it could sound, I think doing it so close to his death and him knowing that death is on the horizon almost helps with that. Cause like, what are you hiding it for at that point? You know, like you yeah. have no, you know, social game that you're trying to like hide or play. Like, I think that understanding gives to honesty. And I think that's one of the good things. And then one thing I like about the book much more than the film even is the fact that you get to encounter that perspective in a way that is just so completely Ebert. It's just writing. You don't have to ex or acknowledge death, like when he's talking in the film, considering his physical state, or he's talking through the computer or anything. Like, just writing, you're able to lose yourself, even though you're always aware of death. And I think it's really interesting with Ebert, how you touch any piece of his content, and you immediately think about his death. But um, I, I think that helps also makes this just a little bit more special. You get that perspective without having to confront his deteriorating state, which is nice. It's not as sad as some of the moments in the documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the written word made him immortal in a way. Um, yes, you want? Um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I pretty much completely agree with what Carson said there. It, it takes a very brave person to write about such personal details it, at, at a time when they could still be criticised for it. But I, I do think it's that, it's like Carson said, and it's like you said as well, Nick, where it's, it's that lingering feeling that he was essentially in his last few years that sort of has this carefree attitude to it. 
and and it, that is quite liberating. And I, I I do think that if if we could all write like that for good, then it would mm. be a very different perspective to have. But obviously that that won't happen. Um, I think what life itself is is essentially a collection of not e but trying to wipe the slate clean, but just trying to get certain things off of his chest, and it it works really well. And I think that might be why it's a bit meandering at times with the sort of anecdotes about friends and past loves and that sort of thing. And it's it, it's it's scatter shot in the right way. It's scatter shot in that memoir perspective, and a memoir should be essentially what the writer wants to say about themselves. And that, that's exactly what it is. He doesn't shy away from anything. And I think the documentary explores that not better, but with a different depth to it and a different perspective to have on it. Um, whether or not that is better than Ebert laying it out for a, a reader themselves is mm-hmm. what's up for debate. Uh, personally, I think the, 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 the debate found in the film, the debate found in the book are two very different beasts. Um, it's it's a, it's strange how, how like the exact same subject can bring about such different conversations. One of them very light, and uh, we'll look at what I've accomplished, and the other one being a dear God, this is this is harrowing. But mm-hmm. let's look at the best bits nonetheless. And it's just that that escalation is handled better in one than it is the other. Yeah, let's let's jump into the documentary. Actually, um, released in twenty fourteen, one year after the passing of Roger Ebert. It is directed by one Steve James, who is more famous for making Hoop Dreams in 1993, which I want to say was Roger Ebert's favorite movie of the entire year, one of his favorite films of the decade even. And so there was already this connection, a connection that Ebert has established with many filmmakers and actors, which is something that differentiates him from more contemporary critics. There are just a lot of critics, and they're all very, like interpersonal, inter, inter, interchangeable for the stars at hand. But like back in the day, Roger Ebert, Gene Sisko, and even Pauline Kay, who's mentioned in the documentary, um, all of them managed to get very up close and personal with these celebrities, which is interesting, but we'll get to it. Um, and so this documentary was actually started back in 2012 when Roger Ebert was still alive. Steve James manages to get a lot of footage of him just in the hospital, going through physiotherapy, physical therapy, sorry, and and trying to regain a bit of mobility as well as trying to watch new releases on his DVDs and just all of that. Again, like you mentioned, Yuan, just it's you're reading the book, you forget how the man looks, you forget where the man is. It's just worse. He's just living in his own memories alive and healthy and you're watching the documentary and it's impossible to forget because they show him very early on that he is pretty much on his deathbed um, even though they don't want to admit it but the man unfortunately was not looking too good and even then it's kind of it is very brave that he embraced his illness very early on if his, his photograph finished on the cover of was it esquire i think in 2007 2008 after his botched surgery. And it's, again, it's brave and commendable. Um, And of course, unfortunately, he passed away during the making of the documentary. And so part of the documentary is Roger Ebert on his bed and trying to like talk through a computer. Part of it is just voiceover that's reading chapters and passages from the book itself. But most of it is talking heads of friends, of family members, of directors, of other critics and uh, newspapermen, journalists. Why do you say newspapermen, journalists? <laughs> um, but that yeah. what I am to you. You're a, a newspaperman. Newspaper <laughs> I'm friendly with a newspaperman. <laughs> I've got a trilby and it says press in the side of it. I've got my notepad and pen. I run up to bonfires in the 1970s and I go, hold on, stop now. You're in a very that, crowded that's... office building. And yeah, like yeah. I, I smoke 20 cigars a day at my desk and I, I drink Johnny Walker. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm a walking stereotype. <laughs> Straight out of the rum diary. Um, but yes, this is the documentary. Um, I really liked it. I think I like it more for the subject matter than the way it's put together. Because it is... Uh, it's What makes it stand out compared to the book is that this is pretty much mostly external voices. It's other people 
talking about him. It's other people filming him. The book is entirely personal. It's entirely in his headspace, which is lovely. But the film is, of course, more objective. So how do you guys feel about this documentary? Um, Yuan, why don't you go first this time? Oh, switching it up. Okay. Hey. <laughs> One prep for that. Keeping it fresh. Um, <laughs> I, I've watched this film three times now. Oh. Um, back when I didn't know what streaming was, I bought a DVD of this from, I remember, Dog Wolf DVDs on Amazon. <laughs> And they were the only people that had released Life Itself on DVD in the UK. And oh, to wow. my knowledge, are still the only people to have released this film on DVD or Blu-ray. Um, and I remember watching it for the first time, and I loved it. Um, it came right as I literally, I must have reviewed about 20 films at that point. This was like when I was I want to say 17 or 18. And, and as soon as I watched it, and I, I'd read a bit of Ebert's books before, like with the reviews and stuff. Like I, I would finish watching a film and I'd be like, what did Roger Ebert think of this? And it was the only critic I could ever do that with, not because um, he was the only one to have reviewed so much, but because his work was so accessible mm-hmm. on his website, which they do quite well in exploring very briefly at the end of the documentary. Yeah, um, RogerEbert.com. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's a tool that essentially spawned, well, not blogging, but he, he was ahead of the curve in what he was trying to do with that. Um, and I remember finishing it. It's like, yep, that's I want to be a film critic. And then for about four years after that, everybody I spoke to said, you can't do that. There's no money in it. And who's laughing now, you little pricks? <laughs> this guy. Um, no, but I, I watched it again when I was in the middle, <laughs> when I was in the middle of clearing out some DVDs uh, to move out, which as you can see behind me, I did not move. Uh, but one of the DVDs I watched was Life Itself. And, mm. and I got rid of it. Um, oh no! <laughs> because at the time, and I think still am now, I've, I was feeling quite jaded and quite like, oh, I'm better than this. And it's like, that's just mad to think that, like, for even a brief portion of a couple months, I thought I'm better than this Roger fella. Um, and I think get out of here. That's I, I exactly, and I think it's both an ego thing, but also that jealousy <laughs> of my god the man did so much like not just film reviews he he wrote scripts he he mm-hmm. produced tv shows he was everywhere and and really watching life itself as a sort of a, a piece that is essentially just a monument to ebert it does a good job at that aspect of it kind of um now that i've read the book it's kind of like that that's the the layer of foundation that you need to watch life itself essentially because the documentary predominantly i'd say is about those final years and it, it, it's it, it both rubs me up the wrong way and is also a really delicately handled moment you you see eber essentially at his barest as you do in the book mm-hmm. um there are some scenes that i think are handled extremely well like seeing eber's recuperation there is no fancy footing there is no there is no hiding those moments because they are just very truthful and it's it's always that bit when they play the leonard cohen song mm. about when ebert's jaw burst open it, it that stuck with me and and it, it's it's realizing that for every moment like that in life itself where there is a genuinely touching understanding of ebert's condition and the impact it's had on his wife Chaz. For every other moment you've got kind of like the montage of the failed emails where it's like it it, it just doesn't sit right when it's compared to something that the footage itself has captured. And I don't know if that's because of the presence of Ebert or not, but just seeing a side-scrolling animation of him not replying to questions in an email, it just felt cheap. And it's... Mm. Yeah, a little bit manipulative. Um, yeah. I agree. I think of, of, of all the parts of the documentary, every section with Chaz, the, the wife, oh, so good. So, so good. You can see when she's kind of putting on a bit of a facade, like she's trying to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm strong, everything's going well. Ah, look, look, you're, we're, we're cracking jokes uh, when, when we're in the, in, the, in the hospital room together. You see, everything's fine. You know, we're taking it very easily and nicely. And then she just breaks down sometimes. She's like, this is so hard. Like, it's so hard to stay behind him because it's like, no shit. Um, when they go back home after his recovery and it's just like 
being a bit of a child as well, which they admit, where he's kind of like, I just bring me up the stairs. No, you can do it, Roger. You can you can walk up the stairs. No, no, no. Say, well, you've been trying to do it. Come on, you did it in the hospital. You can do it now. No, no. Like those parts are oh, they are the most honest. I completely agree with regards to to just Roger in general. Um Carson, your thoughts. Yeah, I pretty much echo what you guys said. I think it, those moments are great. I like the fact that in the movie you get so many more outside opinions. Like, now we actually get to see the friends. So I care a little mm. bit more. You know, I, I at least can put a face to yeah, face to the <laughs> name. Um, but it is a film that just has so much it's trying to be that it gets so lost. And I think it does such a shit job at showing you the career of Roger Ebert. Luckily, I just read 400 pages, so I really mm. understand the career, which is actually funny because I think it's like a great companion piece, the movie in the film, or the movie in the book. Um, but like, there's these weird segments where he reads the book, or where the book is being read to you, and it's like, okay, but no, then it just jumps to something else completely random, and it feels like those scenes were made and created and finalized when Roger was alive then he died and then they just switched the rest of the film but they left those in um it just isn't effective when it comes to showing the objective of his career but when it's a celebration of his career by these outsiders and a look at his last few months alive it is excellent it's like five stars in those categories um just fundamental structure and identity has such clear and present issues that it's really mm. quite disappointing to see. But I still think it's overall, I mean, great. I gave it 3.5 stars. Not that ratings matter, but um, I did really like it. Yeah, that's actually better. We have to mention this. Um, he is voiced by Stephen Stanton when the passages are read. And just just look, looked him up. He's done a lot of voice work for animated films, including a lot of Star Wars recently. Um he voiced Ben Kenobi in the Lego Star Wars the Skywalker Saga game. So, you know, there's a it's fun trivia that we all like. Um, but yes, it's it's an interesting choice. I, I think one of the problems with trying to adapt the book, especially in a documentary when he was still alive and then he passed away while making it, like it's already that's a mess right there, unfortunately, and unexpectedly. So, but, oh, I... The book is so long. <laughs> like we, we said it, the book is so long. And I was watching it, I was like, there's so much that they're skipping over that I really liked about the book, that which they focus more on. And I think that's that's a bit of a, of a problem when you're trying to make this a two-hour documentary. It's like, what can you focus on? You're going to focus on the most visual aspect of it. And so you get, I want to say, probably just an hour of the entire documentary is about Siskel and Ebert at the movies or whatever vari variant of the <laughs> the show that they made. It had like six, seven names or uh, something like that. But yes, and actually I I wasn't too, like I, I did watch a few of those videos back in the day, but never as in depth as in here. And I just, I, I want to know your guys' thoughts on just Gene Siskel. <laughs> Their story together is such a fun weird friendship they're proper frenemies at first but they grow into like liking each other and working together even though they're always uh batting heads yeah just what do you think about those like the actual show itself but also the way it's presented in the documentary my favorite iteration of the show was when richard roper and jay leno did it <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, the serious. true film critics, <laughs> the true film critics. I mean, Ebert wrote about that quite nicely at the end of his book, almost where yes. he was talking about Jay Leno, and it was kind of never expected. Well, I expected it from Jay Leno, but you know, um, <laughs> as as far as the actual Siskel and Ebert pairing goes, it's it, it, I think it, it's that sort of lightning in a bottle effect. You'll never have two film critics or two music critics that can bat back and forth like that on such mm. a consistent level for so many years. I mean, we do this podcast. That's not going to, it's not going to outlive Siskel and Ebert's run, is it? Oh, you know, no. it's oh, no, no, no. nothing, nothing will come close to that unless it's some individual. Um, it, it's just so impressive that even when they just heartily disagreed with each other, 
it, the back and forth was what people went for. It, it wasn't as much about, oh, well, I wonder if this film is good or not. It was actually figuring out what they thought of it. And I think that's kind of lacking in modern film criticism. And I'm sure we'll get on to the big topic of the state of the industry. Um, but as as far as Siskel and Ebert are concerned, there is a reason that so many of people hold them as a benchmark. It, it is because they are such sincere, high level quality. They are they are that perfect blend between artistic integrity of a writer trying to perceive something new and in depth, but mm-hmm. are also really commercially valuable because they are connecting with everyone. They're not using fancy words, but if they are, they know that it's within the context of the film and necessary. They're not downgrading themselves to like a lower gooder of people like Marvel fans because they know that their work doesn't appeal to them. It's it's that perfect balance that I think every every critic of anything should really gun for. And it, it as it turns out, it's much harder to get to that than was first expected. So to do that for decades, whether it was individually with the Chicago Times and the Chicago Sun, or together with those variations of the show is genuinely just astonishing. I'm very jealous. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> Actually furious. Well, you know, there's time. That's that's one of the things that I took away from I'm 22, people. Nick. I'm not getting any younger. That's, yeah, you know, well, there, there's time. There's time. Look my at knees are ruined and my patience has snapped. That's enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I don't know about... I don't know about your guys' expectations here. I fully expect Clappercast to surpass anything that Bitch Ebert ever touched. Um, no, I, I mean, their their dynamic is iconic. It's legendary. I watch it to this day. I just watched Crash for the first time, and the first thing I did was look up Roger hey. Ebert Crash, and I watched it a little bit on it. Um, like, it's great. I think that it's just, I mean, it's really interesting the criticism portrayed in the documentary, because I was like, yeah, no, I agree, actually agree with that completely, but in my mind i think like that back and forth well i think the key point that makes it different from modern film criticism i feel like is just honesty where i think ebert Mm -hmm. has like a little bit of a hard on for like certain film twitter traits that film twitter also does which i'm like okay calm down um i find myself riding with c-skill probably a little bit more but i think like their dynamic is so good and you can tell they're honest you they are okay to disagree and there's this just like respect to it where it doesn't Mm. feel like oh you have to enjoy blah 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 they can disagree they're like well i don't know how you think this way but it's always respectful it's always academic it's always understanding it's always thoughtful it's always smart it's not just like random bad takes even if I disagree with them, like at least they're articulating what they're saying, which is so much more than like every other film Twitter person out there. And I've complained about film Twitter. I wrote a takedown of film Twitter last year, and I used Legendary. a picture of I used a picture of Ebert with a crying emoji over him. So like, yeah, I've been there. But um, yeah, I don't know. But I, the nuances, I'm sure we'll get into it. Provided the documentary, especially, really, I was like. Yeah, maybe I dislike what they did, but I do like the show. I think the show is fantastic. They're the Julia Child of film criticism, and I love them for that. That's actually a good comparison. <laughs> Very on point. Um, yeah, I, I think in in the book it's all right that whole angle about like you know the value of film criticism, but I like the way that it's touched upon in the film because of the external factor, and I think one one of my favorite parts of it. <laughs> Is with Martin Scorsese, who's like, oh, they helped me out, you know, Roger Ebert uh, reviewing Who's That Knocking at My Door, just changed my life, it gave me the energy to go forward and just make more movies, and then they invited me at when I was at my lowest to get an award at Toronto after I made Raging Bull and after I was recovering from drugs, it's like, all of that, it's like, yeah, Roger Ebert, I loved him, best buds. And then it was like, oh, Roger was maybe a bit too attached to the people that he cared about, but he still was very objective and he just like hard cuts to him, destroying the color of money. <laughs> you can see that Martin is still just kind of like hurt by it. It's like, oh, uh, you know, well, did he have to be like that? And and again, it goes back to what you were saying, Carson. It's the honesty 
which is so hard, so, so, so hard. I actually had this conversation briefly with two friends recently um, because I don't know about you two guys, but I've been receiving quite a lot of DMs of people being like, hey, you're reviewing movies on Letterboxd. Can you watch my indie movie and review it, please? Thank you. I spent like 2,000 pounds and mortgaged my house. <laughs> Just, and you're like, what? I mean... Uh, sure. I can do it. You're watching it and you're like, I'm, I'm falling asleep here. Um, there was one, I, I'm not going to mention it because it's gonna, it's not good. But like, I had this problem when I was, I was watching a movie. It was like, I can see there's passion here. I'm, I'm just unable to have any sort of emotion while watching this film. Like, I don't care. <laughs> I was just watching like, I don't care. What can I do? What can I do about it? And then ultimately I wrote a, a, a review for it. It was pretty much kind of like, you know what? It's just a collection of monologues. It's not for me. You know, I'm not a monologue guy. It's well done, though. I appreciate what it was going for. And yes, that honesty that Ebert had is kind of lost. And that's also interesting with the way that he kind of ended up being at the end of his life because they mentioned it in the documentary as well. Like he picked up Twitter and and <laughs> and Facebook very early on. And I just love the line that was kind of like, he has over 800,000 followers on Twitter. That's as many as the Kardashians. And I just wanted to check now. Roger Ebert right now has 676,000 followers. And Kim Kardashian is 72 million. So 800 followers uh, are a drop in the ocean just right now compared to back then. But still, we're talking about a film critic there. Like, I don't even think Mark Kermode has as many as he does. And he's technically the most beloved film critic. Exactly. Mark Kermode has less followers than Roger Ebert does. But yes, the state of film criticism has changed quite a lot compared to when <laughs> Roger Ebert was doing it. So I think that's interesting. Things change. Like, he helped democratize film criticism. He made it so that's, I think it's a line in the documentary as well. It's like, he was talking the way you wanted to talk to people about the movies that you liked or that you hated. And he changed that. And then, of course, that brought properly unqualified people to pretend they are film critic <laughs> like including me. all three of us in the room <laughs> and and just but just no jokes aside like it, it it did brought up bring up a lot of like for film criticism that lacked the heart that lacked the passion and he passed away before influencer was even a role like nowadays it's borderline a job that you can put in linkedin it's like what's your job i'm an influencer oh cool and everyone knows what it is so how do you think Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel uh, as well with their show, with the thumbs up and thumbs down, a very reductive rating that they knew was like that because as, like, what can you do? It's a 10 minute TV show. It's like five minutes per movie. What else can you do? You cannot just spend 10,000 words on a movie. It's just ultimately, should you watch it? Yeah, thumbs up. And that's it. How do you think that their show and their writing ultimately shaped the way that now we discuss about movies on social media, on Letterboxd, that's even an evolved version of like the IMDb forums and reviews. The floor is yours. I think the modern equivalent of the thumbs up, thumbs down system is like the three line reviews on Letterboxd. Ah. Um, that's that's essentially identical. Um, and that's not really a knock at Letterboxd reviews as, as, as I'd once thought it was. People want little capsules of information just thrown at them. They don't want to sift through 500 words figuring out whether or not a film is good or not. Which is a shame because that is where film criticism has changed essentially as as mm. people's attention spans have decreased so too has the increase of social media use began. Um, and what happens is that when everybody talks in 140 to 280 characters that is how much they're willing to read they will not sit and read double that, triple that. They just won't. And to, to adapt to that is essentially sensible if you're using this as a business. I mean, what, what people tend to forget is that Roger Ebert didn't have any ambitions as a film critic before he was given the job. And I think that's, you know, I, 
an interesting career path, especially when it's so clamoured for now. And I think a lot of it comes down to people just think it's, oh, I get to watch movies and write about them. And and as we'll all know, because we're proper film critics, rather than people who sit on Twitter and tweet out Morbius, haha, good. Wait, we, we are? Which we do. Um, we don't? I, I did. <laughs> I did yesterday. Um, but no, what, what we've learned, because we, we do this often enough to, to know that there is a system to, to writing, is that it is more than just sitting and watching a film and, and then saying, I liked this because it is a matter of using the right punctuation, the right wording, the right the right everything. I mean, I, I, I did three years at uni to figure it out and I'm still <laughs> clueless. Um, the one thing that will always stick with me is that we were told never to write in the first person. And that is something that has stuck with me for so long. And I don't think I'll ever break from that because t- to compare my writing from when I did write in the first person with the reviews to now, very, very different. Black and white. Levi Strauss's binary opposites would be fucking real. And they, <laughs> the, it's such a, a difference. And it comes from having a personable opinion on something without actually being personalized in the article. It's being able to progress and inform someone of your own thoughts without actually saying, I think this. Because a lot of film criticism is just, haha. I like the bit when the funny thing happens, 600 likes. That is not criticism. That is a moment that you enjoyed, that people also enjoyed, and that they have liked together, which is great. I'm all for building a community, but as you both know, I'm not really that fond of people or interactions <laughs> with them. Um, so it, 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 I mean, Nick, we spoke about this earlier. It was, I, I can't network with people. <laughs> Because yep. I just, my mind drifts and I'm like, I just want to go back to to reading Andy Warhol books or just sitting doing nothing, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> Spoken like a true introvert. But that, I'm not... <laughs> it's not that I don't want to discuss and debate with people. It's just the majority of people that do reply to my reviews are like, cringe. It's like, right, thank you. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you for your views that pay my rent. Not a problem. <laughs> like, I don't... <laughs> You know, I j- it's it's hard because especially now that it's become such an easy thing to get into, but such a hard thing to make money from, film criticism has become like this big, huge, just swamp of just shit. And it's not because there is a, a lack of quality within it, because there is quality in it. I'm sat with two people that have known that quality for some time. It's the fact that the amount of people that are in it... Are just- <laughs> I'm not just blowing smoke up your asses. Like I do genuinely mean that. I think compared to oh. everything else that we actually have to deal with, it's really mind numbing to see someone essentially just nod their heads along with the producers going, this is really good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just get thousands of likes and opportunities when it's not criticism. It's just what the producers want to hear. And it's back to what Nick said when people would message him asking to review their films. I had a guy email me and I reviewed his film and I said, I, I-, I was more generous than I should have been, but I still <laughs> said it was a bad movie. And he just, he never replied. He never got back to me. But I was smart, and I did the interview first. Um, <laughs> but it's just the fact that I think half of people on social media now use reviews as a way of getting clout and free things, mm. and the other half are using it as a way to network with filmmakers because they want to be a filmmaker rather than a critic. C- criticism is a stepping stone for people that want to do other things. Do you think this is also dictated, like everything that you said is also dictated by the way that just journalism in general has changed Yes, since like the absolutely. Ad- advent, yeah. With, without a doubt. And I think it's it's compared to what I was taught at uni and what I actually do. Mm. I don't want to go into too many specifics in case <laughs> I'm like sued, but it's a massive difference that has positives and benefits, but it also has its drawbacks um if if you'll indulge me i did actually so i i journal every morning because i've got to get the brain rot out somehow and i wrote actually about uh film criticism and writing in general um just to change my perspective on it and it is this and it won't take me that long to read it um i'll just i'll just dive in and nick can cut it when i start waffling on and lose my marbles (laughs) um i'm in love with writing not with art 
Uh, they are conduits for my selfish desire to be either a focus of attention or someone who can cash in on a lack of resources to create something truly pure. The pursuit of writing on and around art comes from the same feral, caveman-like functionality of conversation. For it to happen, the topic needs dissecting. When I first started reviewing, I did it out of passion, and once that turned from hobby to obligation, so too did my passion. It isn't exactly remember. Oh, I can't even read my own writing. It isn't exactly <laughs> remarkable how much solidarity, similarity there is. I can't read my own writing. It's like a spider on ice skits is scribbled across the page. It's because um, you just put it on paper. It isn't exactly remarkable how much similarity there is between my need for work and a poem from the musician Leonard Cohen, which reads, and I, I think at this time of recording, it's actually my Twitter bio header. Oh. Um, I wrote for love, then I wrote for money. With someone like me, it's the same thing. And and to me, it is the same thing. I love the pursuit of, of money and, and the success it brings because there is just this self-aggrandizing desire to just make as much as I can. And I love the position I actually find myself in now, which is essentially writing my thoughts on art, screaming into that big Twitter void and, and never quite knowing if anybody is reading or listening to it. Um, and, and whether or not that truly satisfies me is what I've been wondering for quite a while. Um, I have no idea and will likely not know if I'm satisfied by this work until it is finished. Um, I'm too accustomed to essentially selling my hobbies in the hopes of finding habits. Um, it happened for film, it happened for music, it is happening for books. Um, and I think it all does link to some degree of my burnout. Um, but Roger Ebert I think it was in his was it in his book or his the film where he spoke of the zone where people just get into it and they're so focused both, both. fantastic double trouble um, <laughs> it, yeah so where someone's so good at their work that they just push the troubles to the side and they only focus on their work uh, what what I've managed to do is just that I, I've managed to push all my problems to the side I only focus on work and and the only thing that stops me from getting back to work is a problem or an issue. And when I'm faced with a problem or an issue, my my reaction to that immediately is, well, you should do some more work. You can get yourself back in the zone. And it piles up around me. And I'm never quite sure whether or not the zone is going to kind of collapse in on itself through this lack of passion. Not even a lack of passion. I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't love it. But at the same time, now that the state of it has become quite clear, what people want, what people are aggrandizing, what people really desire from criticism. It, it's kind of hard to stick with the wouldn't Roger Ebert be doing well now? Because Roger Ebert, if he was starting out now, would be screwed. He's mm -hmm. you know, he's not on letterboxd. He's not <laughs> he's not firing out five lines to help producers with their networking. He's not giving four stars to appear on the poster of the mummy, you know, stuff like that. It just it's all a game now when it used to be quite a fulfilling and free opportunity. But I think Amen. Well, Amen. <laughs> there's so much to like break down from what you said. Number one, <laughs> I've always really liked you, Ewan, but I don't think I've ever like necessarily related to you necessarily. Like to where I'm yeah. like, oh I, I I feel very connected to this person's journey. But hearing your journey, there's just also a lot of like weird parallels. I have the same exact first person issue, uh, like debate. No, I don't. It wasn't with uni. It was with a guy named Jack Luke Sharp, who I came in writing for Claffer for like so certain. I was like, there's no way to write film criticism other than the first person. It's such a personal experience. Then he was like, that's stupid. It sounds bad. Write a different way. And I do, you know, so yeah. that's fun. Um, but I, I think it's so what, what frustrates me so much about film criticism and the state of it is it's how trivialized it is because the game is rooted in the success of people with passion. There's a very clear pipeline, I think, from the Roger Ebert to the Chris Duckman era, not mm -hmm. necessarily him himself, to film Twitter. And we're like, I think there was a passion until we got to film Twitter. And now it's no longer, it's not people trying to do even the same things. It's kind of like the Matrix where you have the robots, but they don't like understand the logic. They just understand the action. So they're like, Chris Tuckman got very popular because he got into like the A24 genre before it was popular. And instead, or Robert, Roger Ebert got a lot of notice because he reviewed these smaller films from these directors who eventually blew up. Film Twitter is no longer like, they see those actions and they do not comprehend like, huh, 
these people are really honest about stuff that was not super popular. They use their platform for that. They like just let it be a passion for them and they found success through that. They don't understand that. They just think like, oh, we got to stand what they stand because then that's how you get popular. And sadly it is like that's kind of the also thing about film Twitter or is like, yes, I can criticize these people and think they're annoying, but like. It's similar to you. I can't network with these people. I, I've just realized I can't do it because I just have no interest in, like, interacting with them. I think they're annoying. Like, that's <laughs> truly, like, the point. Like, I have my group of friends on film Twitter and, like, on Twitter or whatever. But, like, I do not want to be friends with these people, which is annoying because that's how you become very popular. And I don't agree with their takes. I'm not going to lie about my takes. So I'm kind of screwed because I don't think Shang-Chi is good, guys. Um, but, <laughs> Preach. But, um, <laughs> It's just, it's so frustrating because it is, though, correct. If you want to be, like, there's names I can name, I'm not going to name. But, like, if you want to be popular and you want to get a following and you want to make money, you can do it. You just have to completely go with the flow and go, like, go with everything that's populist and play into film Twitter. And if you don't want to do that, if you want to, like, be an actual critic or just have it be your passion or be honest... Like, the fact that you cannot really be honest anymore is, like, psychotic. And I all like, I know Morbius is a meme. I know it's a meme, everyone. But, like, I think the Morbius example is so clear. Like, film Twitter decides exactly what they're going to think before a movie comes out. The fact that Shang-Chi had the MCU label before it, they're like, it's great. It's funny. It's awesome. Morbius comes out, and they're like, it's a meme because Jared Leto. And all of a sudden, everyone hates it. And you watch those two films. And the fact that people say, like, Shang-Chi or Eternals is, like, fun <laughs> and Morbius is not. Like, genuinely, though, it's like, what the fuck what are we doing they here? Watch? <laughs> Godzilla, the Kong versus Godzilla versus Kong. Like, there's so many of these films that I sit there and I'm like, this is the most boring shit ever. And, like, I know others would agree with me if they just watch these films, but they don't. And they just, like, decide what they think. And it's so frustrating because it works for them. That's the thing. It's like they have weight in the game if you want to be popular because that is how you be popular. You can no longer be popular going the other direction unless you want to be a Nazi. And I don't want to do that. So it's just it's not I don't know. It's just it's frustrating. But it, it's just it is trivial. It's trivialized the art form which is film criticism mm -hmm. and it's worked for it and it's changed it to where that's the only way you can do it and it's really frustrating it's it's a dark time i i'm, I'm honestly expecting there to be some sort of crash in one year or two because i i agree with everything that you both said about this um the state of film criticism is dire I must have said it. I, I know I've said it many, many times. I don't know if I've said it on this podcast, but I never considered myself a film critic. I never even pursued the possibility to be a film critic, but I love talking about movies. And so the two things kind of go hand in hand, I guess. Um, but one of the things that was kind of alluring, I'm not going to lie, it was alluring at first, which is one of the reasons why I made, I made like movie reviews back in 2013. A few of them are still available online if people... Uh, are good enough at <laughs> going through YouTube. I don't recommend you do it. And they're not on my main channel, actually. But I remember doing them because it was just fun to be talking to a camera about movies that I watched and movies that no one cared about. But I also remember that there was something fascinating in seeing your Chris Tuckmans or whoever just start getting invited to uh, big events. And start seeing, you know, famous people. And that's kind of like, shit, that's a, that's a gateway into Hollywood, baby. And way too many people, I completely, way too many people want the, 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 the reward of being a good film critic. They want the fame that may come with it. They don't want to put in the good work. They don't want to put in genuine passion for the craft. And I see that in general, there's just, oh, there's so many people that I talk to they're just annoying they're just so annoying there's this well I, I, it doesn't listen to the podcast i doubt it but there's this one guy who keeps just annoying me on instagram just <gasps> i can share something like i don't know uh hey we're doing an episode on no country for old man and he just replies to my story and he's a critic and he replies to my story like yeah it's good nine out of ten but there are like ten better movies from the year like okay and 
<laughs> so what's the point here? I don't know. Then he like reviews Gosford Park and he sends it my way. It's like this this wishes it was like Agatha Christie. Like what? <laughs> Wait, maybe he's done something. Here. Hold on. <laughs> that, I, I agree. But it was like, Get this man on film Twitter, and he'll have twenty thousand followers by the end of the not, week. Get this man a Twitter actually. account. Man. Get him on the Twitter.coms. Quick. We've never really interacted. He just shares his reviews with me, and he expects that I agree. And I'm like, I haven't even seen Gosford Park. Isn't it a comedy? Yes, but that's not an excuse. Why do you have to treat me like I don't know what I'm talking about? It's like that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I haven't even seen the film. There's some weird people. Weird, weird, weird people. But they're all seeking fame. And you said it early, earlier on in this segment, let's say, you and Roger Ebert just randomly fell into becoming a film critic. He, was, he just wanted to be a, a journalist, and he was doing a damn good job at that. He had integrity. He was consistent and persistent with seeking the truth in his work. And doing what other people wouldn't, just heads off to the man. And then he literally just went, oh, up five months after he joined Chicago Sun Times, uh, there's the film critic left and he retired. So you're going to do it. Deal with it. <laughs> and that's it. And the rest is history. Nowadays, it's, I don't know, I feel like every five years or so, there's one job that becomes popular thanks to the internet that seems very easy to achieve, that everyone jumps on to. And I've seen that pattern now like two or three times. And now with, with like TikTok and Instagram and Twitter, like social media is so quick, so intense that there's like what might have, been, what might have taken like five, five years for something to take off before. Now it feels like it only takes a week. You need that one viral tweet, that one viral thing to take off. And even then, while so many people try to orchestrate those tweets, and we we have a common acquaintance um, that does that, that's clearly blatantly writing tweets, not because they actually believe in what they're writing, but they write them because they want to be uh, retweeted, they want to be liked, and they want the studio to use their tweet on the poster, on the trailers, as promotional material so that they can get more clout What's the point? I, I, like, I just look at them and I'm like, what's the point? Is it just just for the fame? Just for the money? I guess. Is there actually money? Because, because we look into it. It's not like they're making gangbusters or anything. It's like, oh, is it worth it? You're basically whoring yourself out just for uh, for this like uh, breadcrumbs. And it's, it's pointless. It's properly pointless. The thing is, as well, it's it's not as if good criticism doesn't get viewed. You know, I I don't know like the specifics of Clapper's view counts, but I know my view counts on, on my website, and it's a lot more than a couple hundred likes on Twitter, and it does better. And it, it's it's kind of still... Uh, what's the right word for it? It's still very disorienting and very demoralizing to see that someone can tweet out. I enjoyed recent product by producers, thousands of likes, where someone like us is going to sit and write, really think about what they're saying so that they have the articulation necessary to get across a unique viewpoint and it'll get a couple of views. And it's, I, I, I mean, I'm in a very lucky position where I, I write for nationals and regionals, but I do news and sometimes music. And then my spare time is film criticism. Um, I, I think I like it that way because what it's taught me is that I do not care one bit for not just what people think of me in that sphere, but that I do not care to speak to them <laughs> outside of you two and Jakob and Jack and a couple of other people that I've forgotten the names of. There's people that I like write for my website. Just a big shout out to Tom J and Jack Schimmels, who no doubt will not listen to this podcast, but they Aww. need to know that they they're sort of starting out in the position that we were in a couple of years ago, where it's they're writing and they're learning the craft and they're getting really disoriented by all the shit that comes on Twitter. And it's reassuring to know that there are other people that are sort of starting out on this journey and that they're going to do good for themselves because they are good writers whether or not they're drowned out by the massive just echo chamber of Twitter and the hive mind it's created, 
that's a completely different story. But what I'm always certain of is that I remember because it's when we did that Uncut Gems recording, Nick, when we did Postal and uh, mm-hmm. House of the Dead. Immediately when I'd finished that, I always, it, it, it's whenever I do Death by Adaptation or Uncut Gems or Clappercast, I always get like a little buzz at the end of it. And it's like, I've got to do something work oriented now. I've got to write this. Or I've, I, I just get really invigorated by conversations with good people. And you don't get that on Twitter. I mean, mm. today I, I tweeted out a review of the bad guys. <laughs> And Already I got three, re- three replies. One was, it takes, Ewan's <laughs> takes are so bad, they inspire others. And two flex emojis. Um, how watchable is this movie for someone who is afraid of sharks? And <laughs> it just goes to show you that just because someone has a website, it doesn't mean their opinion doesn't stink. I'm going to give my own review of the movie just to counterbalance. And that says a lot about film criticism. If you think one good movie equals one bad movie too, one bad review, there must be a good review to follow. That's not how it works. If if life were only so just and everything sat at 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, it's just not working that way, though. It's, it sounds to me like you are the modern uh, Roger Ebert. You're inspiring people <laughs> to I, actually write about movies. I'll come out and say it now. I'll I'll admit it for the first time. I am an inspiration. I understand that. (laughs) (laughs) Now, it's it's really difficult for me to connect. And when I actually have tried to connect with people on film Twitter, I just they're so regressive and boring and just like Mm. they. they, Do you know why, Ewan? Because they're mostly teenagers. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it's why is that the 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 bar is fully developed? My brain isn't fully developed. I just know some things are shit and some things are Morbius. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me ask you guys one one of two final questions. Just what do you think is the legacy of Roger Ebert now? Like, do you think there's still then a space for thoughtful discussions on a larger scale than just you know what we're doing for Clapper and just these podcasts? Um, do you think there's a space for like this longer, more in-depth reviews and analysis of films? Or is it just going to get worse and worse and worse as time goes on? It's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. I always look at beacons of hope. You know? Like Clapper, like Little White Lies, like hey. th- those, those websites, like The Geek Show, where these people are coming together through passion, and whether or not they're making extortionate amounts of money the the fact of the matter is is that they are being acknowledged for writing something they are passionate about and that they are knowledgeable about and i think that's one of the big things we didn't quite pick up on is that film critics the best of them are very knowledgeable about what they're writing they're not just pissing in the wind saying oh well i recommend this because i i I saw no country for their old men it's got the same characters in it so (laughs) it's actually thought out good criticism is is adapting something saying if you like this film then you will like this obscure thing from the 1960s that for some reason stars william shatner it's 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 making the connection between modern and past to make sure that people understand it or at the very least comparing a new thing to something that people might like or dislike and explaining why that is and it's it's so hard to do that when your review is wow in capital letters and then just recent film is great four stars there's no depth there's no detail and there's no detail to just listing things either it's not just saying the performances are great fine for a tweet if you've got a review to plug next to it but if every single one of your reviews is just i was so blown away by blank and then the editing was blank and the direction was also blank very good four stars and then like a smiley face emoji I don't understand emojis, to be honest. I I recently found where they were on my phone. It was about a month after I learned what my own phone number was. But this whole new tech thing where people use emojis and don't use punctuation really does kill me because I studied for three years and have two degrees in spelling. But nonetheless, people seem quite happy to just autocorrect in their own minds. So I, I think from now on, I'll just not be putting my words through a spell checker. It will just go out into the void with the rest of it. Um, I think as far as Roger Ebert's legacy is concerned, this is his fault. Um, (laughs) He did an awful lot of good, but he has amounted to an equally villainous shit. I think Roger Ebert is phenomenal. I think he's truly 
one of the few people that could survive film criticism for that long and still mark something interesting every time he wrote. He wasn't perfect. I remember some of his later reviews, especially the Steven Seagal films, which were just boiled down to, haha, isn't Steven Seagal fat? Which is factual, but not necessarily criticism. Um, the the actual, this is not a pun, the actual weight of film criticism is has shifted. And it doesn't really matter as much as it did. I think Ebert was the last truly powerful critic. Because Mark Kermode, for as much as he's loved, I I don't think he's got the same weight to his words. I, I really enjoy Mark Kermode. I really like listening to his podcast. Same, same. One. But I don't think you'll ever have someone that is as respected and revered as Roger Ebert. And I don't think it's because nobody's that good anymore or even better. It's because there is no way of sifting through the sheer amount of just crap on Twitter, which is now the main source of film criticism. Yeah. I agree as far as the respect thing, no one will be respected as much as Roger Ebert, but like, I gen- like not I continue bringing him up, I genuinely love Chris Duckman, I think he was absolutely as influential, like I do not think A24 would be what it is today without him promoting the early films and making them cool to like, um, he shaped film criticism for what it is today, and he has a passion for film. Like clearly, good on him making a film. Say what you want. I don't watch him because no, I, don't no, I particularly I agree. find him that interesting. But like full respect and love for Chris Duckman. I think he's like genuinely up there with Ebert, which is like maybe mm-hmm. people would say trivializing Ebert, but like that was a voice of a generation of film Twitter, and like look where we are, film criticism, and look where we are. Um You're right. I think that Ebert's legacy is dead. I do not see it coming back because there's no reason. Everything rewards right now the system we are in. The studios like it better because it's everyone just saying their films are great even when they're in the not. It's it's easy to find a pull quote in a tweet than a review. It is beneficial for Twitter. It gets the likes to be really short on Letterboxd. Like our culture currently rewards it. Until something mm-hmm. stops rewarding that, it's not going to change. Uh, it's just beyond clear to me that most critics do not read actual reviews they do not read ebert especially like i would love to know actually the percentage of film twitter who's re- read or even watched on his show and they're like three minute clips um ebert's takes like That's too i long. think ebert <laughs> no it genuinely is for people i think <laughs> ebert's is, like yeah. in every sense ebert's dead i wish it wasn't Literally, yes but he is both literally and his legacy has died he's not coming back which is sad r.i.p big man the, the proper end of an era. Um, yeah, yeah, it's bleak. It's Do you think there's bleak. any way back, though? Do you think that's I it? Think, I think there is. I think there is. Because at, at the end of the day, like, we exist. And if I go on Letterboxd, I try to follow very few people and actually have to do a bit of a purge <laughs> because I don't want to follow some people anymore. But um, at the end of the day, there are good people who still write very long, very passionate and in-depth reviews. We've also had uh, Randy Burroughs on the podcast, Jack Keating here, both who write very, like, genuinely great reviews in my mind. And they're writing on Letterboxd. And there's this other, there's another guy that I follow that writes properly bonkers reviews for very obscure movies, and he gets over 50 or 60 likes. And those are a thousand word plus reviews. And I, I doubt people are just randomly liking reviews of a 1970s Polish film. So, you know, <laughs> at least there's 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 a niche. There's a niche. I don't think it's ever going to reach the level that um, there was with Ebert, of like a film critic being that influential, outside of the, you know, the influencer space. Honestly, I, you're right, Carson. I think maybe Chris Stuckman is one of the last film, critis- film critics from YouTube to actually, like, have a lasting impact in the short term. Because after him, there were people like, honestly, even like me and many, many others who tried to capitalize on that. And in the end, it's like, oh, it's a crowded market, it's saturated. Some of them are going to just die out slowly, like my reviews. <laughs> and others are going to keep on going and being prosperous. And, you know, that's that's the circle of life. Um, I think, honestly, you mentioned Carson, that's made me smile a bit. It's just people who don't read the reviews of Ebert or like long reviews and I just thought of a of a quote from Werner Herzog who's also featured like he was a good friend of of Roger Ebert and he's also featured in the documentary and one of the things that he always says is that people have to read um 
and he said recently in a conference that I attended, he was like, yes, one of the things that young people have to do nowadays that don't understand anymore, they have to do two things. They have to understand the human heart and they have to read, 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 <laughs> read, read, <laughs> read. He just started like looking at everyone in the room. And he's right. And that's honestly, I've said it before. I've said it again. This fucking podcast just sparked again my passion for reading. I've been reading way more than I was expecting this year. I've read 40 books as of today, which I, I read like 50 something books last year, which was which is like nothing. I'm going to surpass that. I'm not watching as many movies as I used to, but I'm reading way more. And it's been great. And that's one of the shots that I actually really liked about um about the, in the documentary of Evert is that there's a shot of his house that we just see books upon books upon books, and there's an entire shelf just about Pauline Kale, who he didn't even like, but he still read her all of her books. And that's, I think, ultimately kind of the goal of, of a film critic. It, it shouldn't be someone that you just follow because you agree about the same movies. You should understand where they're coming from, and you should understand why they like or dislike something. And that's why I like to follow some people that I completely disagree with. I don't think we are Carson. We are often on opposite ends of the spectrum. But every time I'm like, yes, this tracks. Like, I, I totally get why you loved Morpheus and you didn't like, I don't know, like, I haven't seen it, but like Crimes of the Future more recently or something like that. It's like, and that's totally fine. And I think it's very just close. People are always like, I, I knew some of them were like, what the fuck? How can you like that movie? And they just almost instantly unfriend you. It's like, <laughs> can we have a conversation here? Is there no, like, can we disagree on something? Isn't that all right? I have my reasons. You have your reasons for liking it. You know, those things are dying, but... It's all a game. Every time I post a, a two-star review, I lose a follower. Every time I post a five-star review, I gain a follower. It's about balancing the ratio. <laughs> It's all about the ratio nowadays, you know. That's I think um, as soon as I clicked and it's like I don't care about followers, I don't care about the 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 fame. I, people listening can't see air quotes, but I'm doing air quotes for <laughs> fame. It does not matter. Not nope. you, you are a drop in the ocean of a very ill looking water, and that's fine. <laughs> Didn't mean to end it so upsettingly like though. No, but it's almost depressing, um, like <laughs> to really find, I think, like you have to just give up. Like you have to give up yeah. on any hope of anything ever happening for you, and then it's just like it's fun. And then when you're having fun, it doesn't matter. Like I cannot imagine trying to do this as like like a career specifically though, like just breaking into it and just doing like I'm gonna play the game perfectly to build a career out of this. Or like I think a lot of people do it just because they want to get popular and then become filmmakers. Um, God, that one director forgot his name. He did the Wolf Snow Hollow. He did. Oh, Jim Cummings. Um, Jim Cummings. Jim Cummings. Yeah. Jim Cummings. Yeah. Look, I think he's been very inspirational. I'm gonna hold my personal opinions, but I think he's been very inspirational in that sense. Um, but no, Nick, I fully agree with what you said about like that perspective. And I mean, you and me disagree all the time. I did almost unfollow you for Power of the Dog, but other than that, like it is really great <laughs> to, with which I assume Death by Adaptation one day when I'll be there. You know, hey, hey, maybe can't wait. Maybe. But um, <sighs> God, Jane Campion, sorry, but um, I <laughs> you, I got the ick. I'm sorry. Same um, track, same track. <laughs> No, Just but do like, the right thing. Two and a half stars for everything after that. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I think that it, it's incredibly important. Just, but I also think film criticism. It's so interesting because, like, there's this. There's kind of two perspectives on why people consume film criticism. It's to engage in a conversation for some, like us, I think. But it's also just casual people try and see a film is good or bad. And I think, the, like, we've talked a lot about length here. And I think it's important to note, like, it's not really about length. It's just about articulating yourself. I think Ebert's three-minute TV reviews, sure, they're not in-depth. Sure, he has he's backing it up with written work, absolutely. But, like, mm -hmm. it's just if you're honest, if you're articulating yourself, and if you are just, like, adding to the world with your thoughts and you're not just doing what everyone else is doing just because everyone else is doing it. Like that's when I value you and your work. And that's when I care. And that's when I like you. It's not that you have to write 2000 words on the bad guys explaining why it's bad or good, which you and you did inspire me. I do have to write mine for clapper today. So I will be 
specifically <laughs> referencing and targeting your opinions because I thought it was really good. good. But um, yeah, no, it's just it's it's that's all I ask. It feels so weird. Like that's all I ask just for you to be honest and use the right <laughs> words. But God, is it missing? <laughs> you're you're asking too much. You're asking it's, too much. It's amazing how lower bar it is to do it correctly. But so many people, like Carson said, if you were going to jump through all the hoops and make this a career, is is immoral to do that. To to actually just suck up to producers and to say, oh yes, mwah, 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 we love your film. Oh yes, please, more of those screeners, big boy. That's just immoral. It's not right. <laughs> it's and to do that really, it it takes both the fun and the actual articulate nature of passion away from it. And I think. I, I might have doubts about my own passion for just writing in general, but I think that comes from burnout rather than I'm trying to suck up to producers in the hopes of getting a, a screen of a Summerland, you know, which <laughs> I did, but that's beside the point. That was a gift. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Anyway, final question for this weeks. I would say week, you know, it's bi-weekly. Does it still fit? Yes, sure. Time, time stops here, Th Nick. Time does stop here. Um, so the last question, very quickly, ultimately, what do you guys prefer? Life itself, the book, the memoir, or the documentary? Ewan, why don't you go first? Uh, the film, because it's shorter. Hey. <laughs> no. Um, I, I think I prefer the book. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it for, for all the great parts of the film, I really like the breakdown of the ebert Siskel relationship, but even that feels a bit manipulative, where they're holding back clips from the same moment intentionally where Siskel and Ebert are fighting with one another and throwing back and forth and then you've got to wait half an hour to realise oh that was just their banter, that was how they spoke to each other because they respected each other and had a very close relationship to leave an audience half an hour of just oh there, there was a lot of frisk behind this <laughs> and then for every talking head to go, actually they were very very close um, it's just such a, a, a twist that isn't needed because it just, it it, it supports a false narrative, and you don't get that with uh, the, doc the, the book. book. Yeah, because the book is just Ebert talking about essentially anything he wants to, and it's really nice to read. Um, it, it goes on a little long in some places, like me speaking sometimes, but it, it gets the job done. <laughs> How about you, Carson? What do you prefer? I'm going to go the movie because I, I mean, I agree. One of the funniest parts of the movie is when they introduce the show and they're introducing just like, oh, they started the show and it cuts from a clip with them, like brown hair, full mustache to like white mustache. hair, completely different. And they're just like trying to pass it off as if it was like the next week. That was great because they just needed the right clips. Um, I just think it's more accessible and I think the highs are higher. Yes, I, I respect the book. I love the book for what it is. It is long, though, and I think when it comes down to really analyzing and having a discussion, whether that be a celebration or criticism of Ebert's career, I think the movie's a bit more engaging and worthwhile. But I think both are absolutely great. I would give both a thumbs up easily. Hey, nice. Nicely put. Um, I have to go with the book, actually. Um, I think the documentary is great about Roger Ebert, the critic, the film lover. But I think the book is great about just Roger Ebert, the man, his dreams, his hopes, his memories. I just, I just love those moments, um, and especially early on, like it was making me tear up early on, where it was just kind of like looking back at his childhood. Like those things get to me very easily, um, and there's so many lovely moments that I've thought about for the past two, three weeks from the book that I'm just kind of like, wow, those stuck with me. Um, some of his memories from Cannes the eerie house in London, um, all those parts, they they stuck with me in a way that the movie probably wouldn't, even though I really liked the use of just, the recovery footage is great, just everything, including even more sweet moments, not only just this Cisco and Ebert show, but also um, the wedding with Chaz and other parts like that, He's sp him spending time with, the, with his nephews in law, just, ah, it's, it's great stuff, great stuff. But yeah, this is it for this episode of the Death by Adaptation podcast. Where can our listeners find you both? Carson, you go first. You can find me on Twitter at BP underscore movie reviews, Letterbox Carson Tamar. Uh, listen to Clappercast. Every single Tuesday, we release new episodes and we review all the new releases. And it's sometimes really good releases, sometimes really bad. So, you know, <laughs> check it out. 
<laughs> a true statement on the industry nowadays. Uh, how about you, Yuan? Uh, no. Just don't look for <laughs> no, him. No, no, no. Don't bother him about <laughs> bad guys. Leave me alone, please. If I could live in the woods with no internet, I would. But unfortunately, life dictates that I must make money. Uh, no. You, you, you can find me on uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook at you and Gledo. E W A N G L E A D O W. And you can find my writing on Cult Following the Geek Show, Narc Magazine, Clapper, Horrorwood, Any Volume, Spotlight, Newcastle World, Sparks and all the Daily Star, Daily Mirror, etc., etc., etc. You can also find it projected in the sky, which I'm I'm going to buy a plane and have it <laughs> a, a, a cloud write out my reviews with one of those jet engines that people usually propose with. Nice. Uh, I'm going to put the bad guys review in the sky, um, presumably over a football stadium. <laughs> Nice, oh man. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at NikkiGran97, and there you can find me Linktree, Linktree forward slash Enjoy the Movies, where you can find links to my short films and videos on YouTube and Vimeo, links to my Clapper reviews, and also, of course, check out the Uncut Gems podcast, where I co host it with my good buddy Jakub Flash and also Randy Burroughs, who's officially the third. No, it's not a third, third wheel is bad. Is a third host. <laughs> oh. I was like, third is not a good term. Um, there's no good term. He's a third host. We love Randy. Um, we love having him on board. And yeah, be sure to listen to that. And of course, you can follow this podcast on Instagram and Twitter. That's Adaptation Pod in the former, that Adaptation in the latter. So thank you for listening. We're looking forward to having you again on the show in two weeks' time. Where we will we will be talking about. Jarvis Cocker, the most experimental episode for this year. We're going to be looking at his lyrics book, Mother, Brother, Lover, and his documentary, Pulp. So stay tuned for that, and we hope you have a fabulous day, and we hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye.